you're well aware, if you've seen the whiteboard, this is a presentation by pre-typing about David Griffiths. So it's a subject <laughs> I know quite a lot. Um, but anyway, there was some confusion about this because the reason I was doing a brown bag is because I went off and I, I did my week's training was learning ski, which is kind of lisp. It's very to lisp. And so what I was going to do a presentation on was going to be getting lisp, that's John McCarthy, got the lisp. And it was going to be writing some code to do some detective work on looking at the map of East End of London in 1888 to identify Jack the Ripper. This was one possible presentation I was going to do today. Um, but that seemed like it was a bit whimsical. So the other thing I was going to do was look at pretotyping, which is by this man called Alberto Savoia, who um, he's, he's like starting very big startups in California and he's been like a, a manager of Google. And it's been used by quite a few companies to, to quickly get things out to market to try and, and it's been used to actually generate quite a lot of money. So I've got a bit of a dilemma on my hands. Because on the one hand I could have done a presentation that was very practical and that was to do with you know how to kind of build a business and make money and that kind of thing. And on the other hand I could have captured a murderer. So between these two things I was in a bit of a dilemma about a week ago. And as part of my dilemma I, I put this tweet on Twitter. So I'm thinking about presentation I need to give on scheme or pre-typing or possibly cooking. And then a minute later, I had a reply back. And it says, I vote for pre-typing. I'm happy to share my slides with you. Alberto Savoia, the man from Google who's made millions of dollars. Which obviously, as you can imagine, did kind of change the situation very slightly. <laughs> so now, I think given, given on balance... I thought, given I'd actually got possession of the slides from the original pre-typing presentation, from the man who created pre-typing, I did the presentation of pre-typing. And this man is following your tweets. He's following my tweets. I think he's searching for any pre-typing references. I'd, I'd like to vote for having the other one at mm. some future date. I think you can buy the two. Well. I, could, I could actually, I could talk about it at the end, if you like, very quickly, a quick overview, give you a bit of a teaser. No, no. You, you could have used the pre-typing to develop an app to find... Could I... Open the air conditioning down a bit. Yes. Well, that's because you're in the sweet spot. Yeah. What was it at? It was at 19. Uh, oh, current 22. Yeah, that was yes. fine. Right. <coughs> this will come on great on the video. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I'd like to say some more. So, so some background as to how we kind of invented this thing. Everyone? For a couple of years from 1999, he actually created a, a startup in California, and they managed to get like first round funding of three million dollars. And about 18 months later, they sold the company for 100 million dollars. So at this point, you know, he was kind of convinced that actually coming up with ideas and making them successful was actually quite straightforward because he just moved from Italy to America and suddenly was selling off a company he got shares in that's worth 100 million dollars. And off the back of that, uh, for the next couple of years, he then moved to Google as an engineering director. And he was the man who launched AdWords, which mm. was obviously the point when Google started to make serious cash rather than just get investment. And he did that within about a year and a bit, and he was convinced that obviously he had a genius for ideas, that he was just one of these people that just came up with ideas that were just going to work all the time and make a lot of money. So on the basis of that, he then went back to the market and did another startup uh, for six years. And this time, because he was experienced and because he'd got this great career behind him, he was able to get 25 million across three different funding cycles. So a lot more money. And after five years, they'd made no money whatsoever. And he actually says in the original presentation, you know, they've gone, a, they've gone for five years and they've made no money at all and they've taken 25 million dollars. And I thought it's really bad because you know, we take 25 million dollars of other people's money. We should just, you know, tell them and, and just walk away quietly. He thought that's not the American way. So he went back and got $20 billion more funding. <laughs> um, but anyway, that fell completely and he ended up going back to Google. And so he started to think, why did it fail? Um, and he discovered what he called the law of failure. And the start of the law of failure is that actually, however good your ideas seem, the vast majority of ideas are just going to fail. Even if you ask everybody and you say, what, what do they think? And if you've got brilliant engineers that program them beautifully or build them well, most new ideas fail. And so if you look at it, I saw actually, it says 95% of all mobile apps. On the BBC News site yesterday, it said that the, the Apple App Store is becoming like a household of zombies because you've got like 98% of these apps 
no one buys and they never get updated. And the ideas, probably some of the ideas sounded quite good when people went to the trouble of writing them cover. And it's strange they put them out and nobody buys them <coughs> at all. And you find four out of five startups actually fail, they lose the investors' money, which is why venture capitalists always want to get in it for one Facebook because they've got 30 other failures behind them. And most innovative technologies fail. So that means that most new ideas, it's not just that most new ideas fail, they even fail if they're really well done. Even if you've got really good engineers and you've run the processes properly and you've done all your market research beforehand and you've asked people what they want, most ideas will still fail even if you do them well. And so he came up with Peter type, which is building the right it before you build it right. And what he means by it could be anything. Be innovative technologies, any kind of idea that you want to try out. Okay? And you can't escape the law of failure, but in the competitive market you can use it to your advantage. And the way you do that is by looking at most companies work like this. Most companies will try a few ideas. And there's going to be this vast majority of them that fail for most kind of products that people launch. A bit different, obviously, if you're a, if you're a service and someone's hired you to do a job, you're going to make money. But if you're generating products, most products are going to fail. And so if you try a few ideas and then you keep at them, you'll fail slowly and you'll get a tiny number of successes. So the prototyping way is to actually try lots of ideas. But when you try lots of ideas, you try and work out really quickly whether they're an actual success, whether people actually want them. Not just that they say they want them, but try to get people to hand over money and that kind of thing. Because then that proportion, even though it's the same proportion, you end up with more successes overall. Okay. And he came with a thing called the prototype, the prototyping manifesto, which is very, very similar to the Agile manifesto. And we're going to look at those first three. Um, innovators beat ideas, prototypes beat product types, and data beats opinions. So the first one, innovators beat ideas. Generally people are very focused on ideas. They're focused on creating ideas and thinking about what the value of an idea is. Um, as if ideas are the basic products themselves. And so if you come up with the idea of a billion dollar idea, and say that you, know, you created this idea and you believe that that is worth a billion dollars, can you actually get people to give you a thousand dollars for it? I tried this at presentations, he still tries it with every presentation. No one has yet to offer him a thousand dollars to see what's in the envelope. No, but he's, uh, he has done one where he offered it for a uh, hundred dollars, uh, one I've seen. That's not too bad then, so yeah. that's probably, what's, he, the, what's the ratio there? So we've got a hundred dollars. <laughs> right. One, one guy, hundred dollars, and he said, and it was a million dollar idea. So he did it as a million dollar idea and a hundred dollars. And uh, someone bought the idea for the hundred dollars. That's ten thousand to one. So it's a pretty small percentage of the actual work. Yeah. But what if he's taken the slide? Well, he can't have taken the slide back because he said these slides are really bad. Yeah, it's that or it was someone else taking his idea. I'm sure it was. Right. Yeah. It comes with lots of terms and yeah. conditions about you know you can't sue him and it might not work and someone else might have thought of it before. So yeah. probably you could actually carry on still using the same idea. I suppose. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, up until the point that I saw the presentation, he hadn't solved it. So what he did instead, he went onto Craigslist, which is the other end of the scale from going off to a business school and giving a presentation with a billion dollar idea. And he basically said, I've got lots of ideas, I'll sell you them for $10 each. <laughs> and then he included his email address, and at that point people just sent him abuse on email and told him to get a job. So it became pretty clear that ideas in themselves aren't actually worth that much innately. <laughs> and he tried to work out why ideas don't really have any inherent value themselves. And it's because ideas are generally in, in thought land. They're in this kind of fantasy, infinite population world where if someone has an idea, lots of people instantly have opinions about whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. And the downside to that is that potentially any idea that you have can be a winner. Now, one example of this was, was a thing called Webvan. And Webvan, um, it sounds like it's a bit like a cardo, or like you know, Sainsbury's deliveries. And the idea was that there was a website, the Webvan website, and you'd go along and you'd say exactly what shopping you wanted, and you'd place an order, and then they would deliver it some hours later at a prearranged time in a van. 
and it just seemed like, you know, this is such a great idea. And you think now there are actually kind of services like this that actually work well. But the problem was, in this case, um, it was a monumental failure because nobody bothered signing up. And there have been reasons for this. Maybe, you know, it was in an area of the country where people were near shops. But basically, in this case, this was an idea that everybody in Thoughtland thought was a fantastic idea, but it didn't change anything. After they'd gone to the trouble of building the site, it still failed. The other possibility is that any idea could be a loser. So if you think about Twitter, if you were initially going to pitch Twitter and say, well, it's a bit like Facebook, um, but you can't really post pictures. You don't look, put a lot of pic, you know, information about yourself in there, and there's a limit of 140 characters. Most people would instantly say, this is just going to be a complete waste. Because even now, it sounds like a slightly ludicrous service, but obviously it's done a very large amount of business. So in Thoughtland, potentially, you can get these false negatives where even ideas that would surprisingly be a success um, can look like failures. So what you do is that you, if you want innovation, you don't worry too much about ideas. You start to think about the people having the ideas and actually look at the process of idea generation. And so he's got an example of um, an innovator. So this, this is actually one person who was one of the early investors in PayPal and SpaceX, the kind of private rocket program, and uh, the Tesla car, and the Solar City project. And these people like Elon Musk, who's... The people that usually are successful are the ones who've actually had lots and lots of ideas, and some of them will be successes, and some of them will be failures, but it's not really the ideas themselves. It's the kind of people generating lots of ideas and being prepared to try them. So, innovators beat ideas. Pre-to-types beat product types. Um, so the real problem is if you spend, if you invest a lot in building a uh, product based on an idea, you might still find out at the end of it that people don't like it. And that's what uh, it's called a product type. So a product type is one which is a fully formed, complete idea that's had a lot of investment. Now I'm a Mac user, so the new message pad is particularly particularly painful. This was the first thing that Steve Jobs got rid of when he came back to Apple. The Newton, um, the Newton was basically like a, a PDA of its time that had really good handwriting recognition. Um, but it was, it was kind of quite big, but people that had them really loved them. But there weren't many people that bought them because it was back in the sort of the, you know, the early mid-90s when no one was buying Apple hardware. So that got capped because he never made any money. Um, aerosol toothpaste. Who'd have thought aerosol toothpaste would have been a failure? Um, New Coke, Web TV, which I think has just been closed down. Um, oh yeah, bottled water for pets. Who'd have thought that would fail in the marketplace? Um, Colgate chicken, anyone know that one? No, no, Colgate chicken. Disposable underwear, um, muck spaghetti. We'll go back to muck spaghetti again in a bit. And even things like Google, like Google Wave, if anyone ever used Google Wave. Um, Google Health, Google Answers. So you can get things which if you put a lot of investment into them, even if you build them really well, are still going to fail. So how do you avoid that problem? With pre typing uh, which is, this is the dictionary definition, validating the market appeal and actual usage of a potential new product by simulating its core experience with the smallest possible investment of time and money. So let's look at the example. Back in the 1970s, um, IBM had uh, the idea that what they could do is build a computer system uh, which would allow people to talk to it and it would type what they said. And it just seemed like, you know, this would be a really valuable idea. And they asked people what they thought and they said, well, as long as that's built really well, as long as it works well, because they suspected it would be flaky, as long as it works really well, I would spend a large amount of money on that because, you know, I could replace the typing pool and I could just, you know, create my own documents really quickly and the thoughts would just become documents. And so what they could have done at that point, they could have spent millions trying to get large computers to try and analyse speech and turn it into text. But rather than actually spend that money and build a computer system that could do it so they could try it out, instead they brought people into an office and sat them down in front of a screen with a headset and they had a, an audio typist next door that was listening to them and typed everything they said. Okay? At that point, people thought this was still a computer system, and they could then try it out for several hours. And what they found was 
After several hours, their voice started to get tired. If they were trying this out in a room with other people, they suddenly couldn't create any kind of um, confidential documents because they didn't want other people to hear. So even though this was going to work as well as it ever could, because you've got a human being with a brain on the other side of the wall, uh, people still didn't like the idea. And so they could cancel it and they spent almost no money. And the thing that they, they created with this person inside the wall, uh, Alberto initially called a pretendo type, but thankfully shortened it to a preta type. So a preta type, this is one particular type of preta type that's kind of fake it before you make it option, was where they put in almost no investment just to see if people would be prepared to hand over cash. So, you know, they started off saying, we love the idea, uh, as long as you can build it right. So they had the, the idea of, you know, ideas are great, and as long as you build things properly, we'll hand over cash. But in reality, even though before it started, they were saying, oh yeah, most of us are going to go and buy it, and we're prepared to spend a lot of money for it. Once they actually tried it out, they found the exact opposite was the case. Now, another example, the original Palm. The man behind Palm, um, years before he created the Palm Pilot, had created uh, another portable computing device, you know, a bit like the Apple Newton. And he'd been in a company where they, I think he was the head of engineering, and they spent a long time in investment in creating this thing. And, and it was a brilliant device, but no one bought it. And he suspected that the reason no one bought it was it was too big to fit into their pocket. So he thought, well, he could go and create a much smaller, miniaturised version of that original device and then see if he could sell it. But that would obviously take a lot of engineering. So what he did instead was he carved a piece of wood on the right-hand side. I think this is from the Computer History Museum. Um, he actually carved a piece of wood that was the exact shape and size of what he wanted, which was about as big as he could fit into a pocket. And he layered it with pieces of paper with appointments and people's phone numbers. And he carried it with him for a few months. And if anyone asked him if he was free next Tuesday, he could take the block of wood out and get a little toothpick and actually pretend to be using a palm pilot. And the thing he found was that it wasn't actually too annoying. He actually did carry on using it, and he could still kind of, you know, go through with a toothpick. <coughs> and, it. and so then he knew that there was probably a reasonable chance that people wouldn't get annoyed with it. They might actually use the product. And so he built the palm pilot. So prototyping. With prototyping, you, in, you invest days and weeks, and you're, you're thinking about engineering questions, whether something's technically possible. And your focus is on actually getting a working prototype, a fully functional thing with all of its gizmos and things you know, that you can get out uh, to market and build the whole thing. With prototyping, you might end up creating a very simple prototype, but really the focus is spending a very small amount of time and trying to work out whether or not someone would use it. And it says here, working prototype, but working prototype, because obviously it might not really be working, but it gives somebody the experience of the thing. So, fail fast. The longer you actually spend on a thing, the more the investment. So if you can fail down here, you'll spend far less than if you fail a few years down the line. So, this was um, a Google workshop where they announced that they were going to they were going to have a prototyping workshop, and everybody that attended, as a thank you for actually attending the workshop, was going to be given um, a fully working prototype mobile app development kit. When they got there, they found it was a post-it note and a pen, and so everyone in the room had to come up with an idea for like a mobile app. And what they had to do then was draw the mobile apps out on a post-it note. And then they would have to carry them around, just like with the Palm Pilot, and try and use them. And so one person came up with the idea of an application called Park Jerk, where if someone in the Google car park parked in a strange way, they would pretend to take a photo. It would then go and post that photo off to um, Picasso, and they would be able to leave a rude message for whoever had parked badly. And what they found was, actually no one ever bothered using it. So instantly, even though it was just a post-it note, they could see that even the inventor of the application never bothered using it again. And they're currently working on a, on a prototyping application called Androgen, um, which allows you to very quickly kind of, it's a bit like kind of, um, what's that, Julia, what's that wireframing tool? Balsamic. That's it, it's kind of like Balsamic. It allows you to kind of create a faked up Android application so you can 
try it out. There was another example actually in the printed typing book where um, he talked about having an application where you could get a mobile app that would take a photo of your food and then it would instantly tell you uh, how healthy it was, what the fat content was, what the calories were and that kind of thing. And obviously that would be a very complicated piece of code to write so what you could do instead is you could have that thing basically email the photo to a dietitian who could then manually fill it in and obviously it would take them a lot longer to do it but if you've only got a few people you could see straight away whether people would use it and if people can't be bothered to take photos of food which given that 90% of Instagram is photos of food people probably would but if they didn't then you've not actually had to do much work and certainly no development um, so stuff about Android Gen which has not been released yet um, and that's the kind of app it can produce for park jerk so, retail service is an interesting one. Best Buy, big electrical retailer in America. And they were trying to get, when, when I think it was the Xbox 360 or something was released, they're a big electrical retailer and they wanted to try and get people to buy it from them than anybody else. And obviously it's always going to be the same price everywhere, it's always going to be the same product. So they had to distinguish Best Buy from Target and Walmart and all of the others. And they had this idea of having like a kind of trading deal. So if you've got any other kind of console, regardless of what it was, you know, the little kid could come in with their old console, they could get a trading voucher for some price for that console, and then they could use that to buy the latest Xbox. And rather than actually roll that across the country, because they had no idea whether this was going to work, they tried it um, in a single Best Buy store. And they put a tent up in the car park and they told people locally through flyers what was going to happen. And then eventually this became known as the technology trading. And so you had all these kids that turned up and they were handing over their old consoles and they were giving them a price for it, giving them the voucher and they'd go and buy the Xbox. And they actually found that this worked really well. That people were quite happy with the idea of doing a trade in game up to the next console. But then of course they've got the problem that they've got all these really kind of old broken consoles, what could they do with them? So they simply sold them on eBay, which you could never do with a kind of large scale nationwide thing, but at least it meant they could get some sort of value back. And because it was actually worked out to be quite a success, they could bring it in as a, as a proper product or service. There's a man selling things on eBay. Oh, that's a great product. Who doesn't want an iPod enabled <laughs> toilet roll holder? A serious product someone actually bothered to build. So anyway, you've got to make sure you're building the right thing before you invest a lot of time building it right. Building it right is secondary. Pre-to-storming. Um, so brainstorm is where you take ideas and turn them into opinions. And ideas obviously don't have much value. So pre-to-storming is the process of trying to get pre-to-types and then trying to find data from them. Um, so this is basically like experimentation. This is where you actually build a pre-to-type and then you try it out in the market. And it's very different from brainstorming. So let's go through different ways that you can pre-to-type. Mechanical Turk <coughs> pre-to-types. You know there was a thing in the 19th century where there was a, an automated system that could play chess and you'd play this robot and it was quite good at chess and it's because somebody was sitting underneath. So Mechanical Turk pre-to-type is like the IBM speech to text. It's where you're actually creating a fake or like the someone taking a photo of the food and there's a dietitian behind it. It's where you take the complex computer bit that would be really difficult to build and you replace it with a human being. Um, Pinocchio pre-to-types, where you build it out of wood, you know, it's not a real boy. This is where you, you if the big issue that you think keeps it from the market might be things like a, the form factor, the size or the shape or whatever, you fake it up in some way. It's obviously, I can't think of a direct equivalent for software, but you can see the kind of physical ones, that kind of thing becomes important because you can try out what you think is the key feature. Fake door. He wrote the book, um, and it's actually it's not four dollars ninety nine. It's ninety nine p. I've been caught by this before, where you see a Google ad that announces some new web application, and then you click on it, and it says we're still in very early stages of beta. Please sign up, and we'll tell you when there's more to know. It probably doesn't exist at all. It's probably just a Google ad to see how many people bother clicking on it. And if you don't get a lot of people clicking on it, you don't bother building the thing. So it's quite a nice way. It could be said that that's slightly dishonest <coughs> because you are kind of you know, lying and you are using people's time while they click on it to say, but it's probably better um, than writing a book that no one buys. I'm thinking of headfirst programming. 
Um, you know, if you're going to do that, you're probably going to get someone buying the book and then they don't like it. So this is probably a slightly less dishonest way of working. This minimum viable products, there's another methodology um, which is called the Lean Startup by Eric Ries. And the Lean Startup is actually like uh, a particular instance of a prototype. With a minimum viable product, you, it's like a kind of, it's quite close to prototyping but you try as quickly as possible to build a real genuine thing. You're not doing a fake one made out of wood, you're not using a human being, but what you're trying to do is get just the core features of a thing and you release it as soon as possible. And we'll see later with, with Buzzroom, that's the, it's kind of going down the minimum viable product way. Um, I think the key difference between that and a, a product type would be how long it takes to do it. If you can do it in hours and days, it's a minimum viable product. If it's going to take you 18 months to get the core features in, then it's probably a product type. Um, one night stand prototypes, like the tent, taking in video games and replacing them. Um, or impersonator prototypes. This would be like if you wanted to create a mobile app <coughs> that recreated some other kind of desktop application. Maybe you could have a server that does a screen scrape or something to take information off the proper application and you funnel it through a different channel so people think they're getting one thing but actually behind the scenes it's just the same old thing as before. Um, okay. But finally data beats opinions. So the whole point of getting the thing to market is to try to decide whether or not this thing's worth building. So once you've done that you want to get away from people saying, yeah, that's a good idea, or no, that's a rubbish idea, don't bother. You want to actually try it in the market and then get data. But if you get data, you need to make, have some way of making a decision. So how do you do that? Well, if you think about someone trying to invest in your company, if you just say, oh, I've got this really great idea that's worth a billion dollars, no one's probably going to give you any money. Maybe for a million dollars, but not for a billion dollars. <coughs> If you've got like a pre-to-type or a prototype, they might be slightly more likely to believe you because there's a real thing there, so they know you're not just going to fly off to a beef and cash. But really the best thing you can give them is usage data. And you might think usage data would be like how many people <coughs> buy the minimum five product. <coughs> you know, how do you tell if it's a hit or a flop? Well, a flop is going to be a failure in launch operations or premise. So let's have a look at a flop. Yeah, we'll go through, have a look at the number of people that you can actually, are being offered the product. There's the initial take up of the people who actually try it out, but then, much more importantly, is the kind of the ongoing use. That's the initial level of interest and ongoing level of interest. So if you look at Webvan, what was the problem with Webvan? Well, everybody thought it was a great idea. And to be honest, even now I thought that sounded like a great idea because it sounds like a car then. Um, but what happened was, of all the people who could have signed up, almost nobody signed up for it. And then because almost nobody signed up, there was no ongoing level of interest. So that was really a problem with the premise. People really, although they thought they liked it, the fundamental um, product, they just didn't need. Then you get something like um, Google Wave, where when Google Wave, if you remember, came out, people were desperate to get a login to Google Wave. So of all the people that could have, you know, all the Google users, people that had an invite to use Google Wave, the vast majority actually signed up for it. But as soon as they signed up for it, it was kind of, well, what is it? It's kind of like a wiki. It's not going to replace email. It's not sort of messaging, but it's a bit odd. And so the ongoing level of use was the thing that really killed that. Um, if you look at hits, what you get there is you may get uh, a large initial take-up, but importantly, there'll be a long ongoing usage. So for Gmail and Facebook, lots of people use them. For things like the MacBook Air, that was still a hit because even though much, much lower percentage of people actually used it, they would carry on using the thing, buying things for it, using it day to day and telling other people to buy it. So it's not so much the initial take up, it's more that ongoing level of usage. Uh, which you can then continue to look at in cycles to check to see whether it's actually worth putting more time into it. So this is now a pretty story exercise. So if you were going to do Webvan now, imagine Webvan had not existed and it wasn't a failure. What kind of thing could you do as a way of pre-typing Webvan? Interactive session. You can get people to ring up and then 
in a small area. And That's it. I mean, would you, would you actually need a website for it? No. You just have a phone number and a poster or something? Would, do, do, so you could try out the fundamental idea of whether people are happy having somebody else go and choose their products for them and they deliver them in a van. They could have tried that out in a way and it would have probably failed. But at least it would have failed with almost no investment. Um, it's an interesting one. Muck spaghetti. When, when McDonald's decided that people really wanted some sort of plastic trays of hot spaghetti, you have got any ideas about how you could have actually pre-typed muck spaghetti? Well, very limited one or two stores. Try it that way. There was one thing I heard that I thought was quite clever was that you put it on the menu and then if anyone asks for it, they say, I'm oh, totally sorry, I'm afraid it looks spaghetti's off today, but then you note down that they've asked. <laughs> and so in that case, it's just the print of putting the thing on the wall, which again is slightly dishonest, but it's probably better than, you know, putting people out of work in the look spaghetti <laughs> factory. Oh yeah, bottled, bottled water for pets. Any ideas? I mean, for something like that, you could probably just get normal bottled water, because let's face it, that's all put it is, and then put labels, labels on them, put them in the and put them in a pet store. Absolutely. And I started to think, actually, that was a ridiculous idea. But then I remember telling my mother the first time that people were buying bottled water for humans, and she thought that was ludicrous. And if you think about it, it is. It is, yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, so we've got all of we've got all of these failed examples, and this brings me to my possibly failing. So the reason I was doing this in the first place was because we've got black pepper labs. And black pepper labs on the wiki page, when you have to do a pitch for this, um, I think it was Chris Lilly putting this thing saying, we're going to be using the prototyping methodology. So I went off and read the book. So this is my potentially failing idea, which I accept wholeheartedly is probably going to fail with a 95 plus percent uh, degree of certainty. So the idea with Buzzroot is that you can basically draw a route on a map and then when you get to start that walk, you, you click on the start button, and at that point it carries on tracking you. And as soon as you walk off the map, it will vibrate and make a sound. Okay, so that's the basic idea of it. Which I thought seemed like a reasonable idea. Uh, but obviously that doesn't mean anything, because that's just doing things in thought land. So instead, um, I've had uh, a bit of time allocated. So I've got the app, it's kind of, it's going to be like a minimum viable product, because I've got it on here, and it kind of works. I'm just trying to stick in some extra mapping data on there so you can kind of go in there and you can see a map and you can draw on it and things. Um, but just having a minimum viable product is not going to be enough. So what I'm going to do, obviously we can work out the initial level of interest, probably one day next week. I'll fit it up just enough so it's shippable. And then the initial level of interest will just be however many people download it. I don't know how many it will be. I think if it's like four people, I need to worry about it. If it's a couple of thousand people in a month, that's probably quite a good sign. But that's not enough to actually know whether it's likely to be a success. Because it could be like Google Wave. Um, so it needs to get some measure of the ongoing level of interest. So I think what I'm probably going to do is stick some kind of... I asked Alberto about this. Alberto, my friend. Um, I said, you know, maybe we could stick some sort of Jason call or something whenever it's started up. So it might just be to a web capture or something really simple. Or Google Analytics or feeling and so you'll have some sort of level of the ongoing level of use. So if it gets a couple of thousand users, and if it looks like they're using it at some future date, it's probably some kind of argument to then go to Mr. Cook and say, well, you know, rather than just it being a product I can show you, it's got this many downloads and it's had this many people using it, can I stick this feature in? And if, as is likely with a 95 plus percent of chance of failure, it doesn't do any of that at that point, I don't have to do any more work on it, I have to call something else. So that's the sort of the practical um, why, why I started looking at it. Um, I don't quite understand this slide, but apparently the intersection between vision, ideas and opinions, and reality prototypes and data, is innovation in flames. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so that's the prototyping manifesto. Um, are there any questions? I will now take a drink. Do you think this approach is, is, I mean, for instance, even some of the examples that you gave, things like Red Ram, or even the spaghetti at McDonald's, I can see that there are ways to make that potentially work, but not in such a quick um, way of saying, right, you know, we need to have a, a yes-no decision on this within three months, and we've got to do a quick prototype, 
Because, I mean, there are web vans. Like there are, there are web vans, it's true. Is, it's going to be huge. I suppose the issue is that there must have been something about the web van offering that was different from a car though. Yeah. And I don't know what that difference was. But if they could have done the the prototype to get as close to what their idea of how that ordering works, maybe it wasn't all from one store. Yeah. Maybe they just went, I mean, actually, I could probably give you an example. Like when I got married, when I got married, I went off to the National Wedding Show. Yeah. Um, and the National Wedding Show seemed to have kind of three things there. It had male strippers, free alcohol for women, and there was a, a website called the Gift Registry. So obviously, I went to the giftregistry.com website. I thought it was a website, it's just kind of more my thing. Um, and I signed up for the giftregistry.com, and it was something like Webvan. So you could put your gift registry list in there, and then somebody somehow would go out and do the shopping for you and they'd post it to the to the happily married couple afterwards. And the gift registry went bust six months later. Now it's kind of the same thing as a car though. You know, it stuff gets delivered in a van, people are ordering it online, but there's clearly some sort of difference. And there's some sort of difference between web van and a car though. But working out what that difference is is kind of very difficult to do in thought that. Yeah. So I think the idea is that whatever your conception is, you can put it out there and see. And you know, it, I suppose it's always possible that someone could try pre to type in a cardo mm -hmm. and it wouldn't work. I don't know. Maybe there was a, a feeling of security in that particular case. You wanted to know there was a large company behind it. I don't know. But I could see, I get your point, I could see there could be circumstances where you might kill off something too soon. Or yeah. even worse, you keep flogging a dead horse for too long because something in your pre-to-typing suggested that people actually like it and will pay it. But it's probably a bit less likely, particularly in that second case, because if people are giving you some money, at least you've got already some level of interest that's practical. You've got, a, you can, you've got just enough encouragement to do a little bit more and see if it improves it. Yeah. Okay. But I do get your point, yeah. And I think also it's something that doesn't really work with the kind of... Um, some other kind of consultancy service models. You know, if you're going off and someone says, oh, we want you to go and build multimedia fax machines and here's some money and, you know, we'll give you a fixed price for this and we'll make a profit later. At that point, you probably don't need to worry about whether the product works. You just take the money, build the multimedia fax machine and say, there you go, because you're not taking the risk. So I think this is particularly for kind of products. If you're doing services consultancy, maybe that's not it but this is really for the idea that you are trying to put something out there that people accept and in some way of them accepting it you make money so they're either giving you money or they're visiting the website and you're getting advertising well presumably the person commissioning those services they could they would, be, they would want to be doing this before deciding exactly because once they've gone yeah this is this this is actually interesting now and then they go off and Absolutely, yes, but, you know, it, but if they've not done that and if they're prepared to give us money to provide some sort of fixed price service or to provide so many days of consultancy, we're not really getting any risk with that. So no. I think for the service and the consultancy side of the business it doesn't add a lot, but I think in terms of putting <coughs> products out there it's quite an interesting way of kind of killing things off quick before they become you know, a lot of work. Let's suppose I've got an idea for a new musical instrument. Has anybody got any ideas on the pre type of that? You could take the uh, wooden block approach for the palm pre, so say, you know, you want to try the... Uh, but with the palm pre, you could actually, you know, do stuff with a toothpick and... As you actually come and go, where? where's my drill? Yeah, obviously you, it would you, be. You'd want some kind of... I guess it depends at what stage you, you're doing. If you want to get like the basic form factor of it, then uh, you know, a, a physical mock-up to try that out would be really fun to look at what it sounds like then. Yeah. And you know, synthesized sounds that get played yeah. when you press particular buttons on yeah, it might so be, yeah. be Well maybe you could have a minimum viable product, so you get something that's kind of, you know, not polished, it looks like a big block of wood with some strings on it or whatever the basic idea is, and you try it out at a couple of gigs and see if people are actually like the sound of it. I suppose the thing is if it hasn't got polish, that doesn't matter. You know, if it if it looks a bit strange, as long as because the core experience is probably like 
the heft of the thing to the museum, mm -hmm. the, the musician, not the museum, um, and the sound of the thing to the people listening. And if, if that core experience can be reproduced, maybe it's not even done in wood, maybe it's 3D printed or something. You um, do have to be careful in that area, though, because if you plan on patenting or doing whatever you can to get internet, um, intellectual property protection on that device because you want to market it, then if you bring out your prototype to a public area, you've lost your, you've lost a lot of protection you might have. The comfort though is that there's this massive chance it's going to be a failure. Yes. But yeah, but <laughs> yeah. it would be nice to be in a position but where your main, you know, that you're like Mark Zuckerberg with the Winklevoss twins, that your, your main concern is that you've got billions of dollars and someone's trying to sue you for a couple of them or they're trying to steal your idea and do a poor version of it. If you yeah, give if you away any issue. protection you might have for that 5% chance, then all you've got is, I mean, you've got 95% chance of failure and 5% chance of success that doesn't matter. Hmm. I think you, you, you've probably got some protection purely in terms of like prior art, but it would be harder, it's true. Patenting, um, you cannot do one, you cannot patent something after you've publicly made it available. Right. Okay. So, I'm not a lawyer. Yeah, so. But you know, as with yeah, most things you put your patent application in as soon as you had the, uh, the idea and scribbled your your new musical instrument down on a piece of paper. Um, yeah, it, okay, you'd be out the cost of the, you know, the patent application, but um, you know, as with a lot of products, the patent doesn't yeah. get approved until years after the thing's been out and in, in the in the public usage anyway. So. so if you restrict your audience, does that mean that the publicly available hasn't happened? Yeah, if you if they all sign a, a statement saying that they're, you know, they're not yeah, non-disclosure non type yeah. thing, then yeah. the distinction, distinction here is the idea versus product. Isn't yeah. It? So you know, if you take the IBM example, the patentable stuff would be the really you know, fancy um, tech, voice recognition software, wouldn't it? Which you haven't yet built, you know. So someone someone's free to go off and they can do the research, and yeah, if they yeah. independently got it, I suppose, yeah. I mean, one thing I thought when you presented that is I, I reckon that they did, actually that 100 percent they did the right thing, didn't they? I mean, you know, they, they, but they probably were investing you know, a significant amount of money in a research lab somewhere, trying to get somewhere along that journey. Mm. They probably weren't saying, "Oh, we won't even bother thinking about voice voice recognition until we we we, we, we prove there's a product," because then they would have been. You get the feeling that there. something was must have motivated them. That maybe yeah. it was looking like it was a hard technical task, and people start to think already spent a couple mm. million. Is this ever going to work? Is it even worth bothering? And, and maybe there's value to both because mm. you know you, you just have a nice you know, rather than hundred percent uncertainty you can never deliver it. If you have one percent one percent thought certainty that you might be able to get there. I suppose it's something where if you have to do some you might have to do some work in order mm. to, to work the thing. I suppose with you know the, the block award of the speech to text you could probably get away with no work, but maybe you'd have never got to the stage of worrying unless some work had been done. There would be some other kind of minimum viable product things where you'd have to do something because otherwise you've got nothing to sell. Or with the palm pilot, you, you might be worth investing in, in a touchpad screen because you know you've got an in, you know, you've got in mind you can use that on some product. Yeah, if they, do, if they didn't mm -hmm. exist at that point, you probably wouldn't have to get as far as the blocker would. Mm -hmm. If there was no way that they could get the basic components for using a toothpick on it, mm -hmm. things that maybe. Does he um, just advocate this for entirely new products or for new versions of existing products as um, well? I think all of the examples in the book are really new products. Um, I suppose that's, that's one of the things. If the thing's already rolling, you could argue sure, that you've already got like a prototype there. Uh, yeah. But maybe there is a way of doing it in some well, sort presume, of feature. Presumably you could thing. bring down the feature level. So you, you were talking there with your um, Buzzroot app of saying you might do something simple like just having a, uh, uh, the app. The app ping a, a service that you can log your, um, you know, the interest uh, of the app yeah. itself. But, you know, you can do that with, and, and um, you know, companies do this with A-B testing for, you know, for, for, for new features on websites and things. You can have actual features report back as to the amount of usage that, uh, That's a good point. They, they I, did, I did wonder about having a thing on there where it would have, like, uh, in the setting, because one of the things I thought would be quite a cool idea, but would need a lot more work would be, if, mm -hmm. Because it's quite painful drawing routes, if you could share them and make them public and see other, one, other people's ones, and maybe if there was an options dialogue, 
that has enabled sharing with other people to see their roots and yeah. then you click on it and at that point far off a survey saying they're interested but then it says oh at the moment I'm afraid this is currently in development so if you're interested in the beta contact yeah. it's here. It's a bit like that you know like the, I, I, the false mean, front door way of... I've, I've done that with a website that I've put together for some friends to use essentially an online chat room kind of thing um, and people were asking for a, 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 a Event, you know, essentially calendaring for organising events bit in it. So I put a quick link up on there saying, you know, yeah, to, you know, to you know, create a new event. Uh, but then, yeah, you know, again, that wasn't implemented. It just popped up a thing saying, you know, coming soon, essentially. But you know, it did log. You know, sometimes people use that, and so it was all well, actually too vast of it. Only half a dozen people clicked on it. I'm not going to waste my time, yeah, you know, mm. doing that. So you could, yeah, you know, you could do it for like, yeah. like say, maybe in testing, yeah. try one way and then the other, and then yeah, yeah it's true. I think there's a bit of crossover with services like Kickstarter, where you can sort of put mm. an idea yeah. out there, get money, get people committed to your products, and then go right. Like, I think that's really interesting because Kickstarter is like the, it is kind of like it's out in thought land, isn't it? Because they are sort of ideas, but it has to be about to become a real product. And they, they, they have had to tighten up on that um, recently. It's actually, yeah, so for, uh, particularly for, um, Electronics projects like the Pebble uh, smartwatch thing. I've never seen that. Um, yeah. yeah, there was some pre had some ones where it was purely just an idea. And people raised a whole lot of money and then just went, ah, you know what? It's not happened, uh, and then walked off with uh, with all the money because Kickstarter doesn't enforce that the idea has got to be done. So they have put. A, it's the uh, Pebble watch not going to happen. The Pearl Watch is happening, exactly. Now, but, um, to get one of those. They, they, it, changed, it changed before then. They had to have a working prototype that they could demo as part of the um, uh, Kickstarter. Personal thing. invisibility yeah. cloak. <laughs> yeah, particularly, yeah, particularly with, yeah, yeah. with more negative. You four million trying to develop it, but it just failed. Yeah. A lot of producers, you know, we've got this idea for a musical. Yeah. <laughs> Damn, we'll have to keep all the money. Yeah. But yeah, because I mean, that's, that's one of the things that the idea there is that they're all really lightweight. If you can't get funding, it never happens. And yeah. you get people that just generate mm -hmm. lots and lots of ideas. Because it's, it's not the ideas, it's the generation of them that's there. Because things like how does this work with software, especially on like low level software, and developers and the consumers of that software? But it sort of made me think about Kickstarter, because I saw somebody put um, some pages together on there about sort of like implementing. A Git client in JavaScript so you could run it in the browser or something. And he's like, Well, I can do it. And you put a page up there and threw it out there. And most people said, Yeah, I'll pay for all this time and money. It's how it's called a job, isn't it? And yeah, you know that. Yeah, yeah. 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 so now he's doing that. He's doing a little project and he's got all these credentials saying, Yeah, I can do this. It's again. quite nice because then it fuels the whole process, does it? You do very little to begin with, then you get funding and then it kind of keeps itself going yeah. until yeah. people don't like it and at that point you stop. Yeah. yeah. Well, I suppose similarly as well, you've got the uh, Minecraft approach is, is, is similar, where you know, it starts, starts a very you know, basic version of, uh, of the game, just shows the, the, the roots, and then you could buy the application when it was in beta for, for years, you could buy it and you'd get you know, all the updates and things, and you know, as, the, as the features were developed, you get a new, new version of it. Um, so it's similar to the Kickstarter model, and you've you know, got interest in you know, yeah. Without having to invest a whole lot of time, you know, you can even millions off that and start a company and developing other things, you know, from it. Um, I guess, you know, at the core, it's the same thing, isn't it? It's um, red gauging the level of interest yeah. before you've invested a significant period of, you know, yeah, time or more. Or so, so much. Money. And also, if you look at things like Y Combinator, where they they kind of give out like twenty five thousand dollars, they do very small amounts of funding to get very small mm. ideas going so that they can see whether they work or not. So it's not like the kind of $23 million of third round funding mm. to go and build an idea that no one wants. Yeah. They get lots of people with very small amounts of money and out of that kind of incubator mm. of, of startups, you know, you get the old drop box and yeah. it pays for all of the rest that fail dramatically. Um, so yeah, so it's a different, much more lightweight. I suppose, yeah, you could integrate it with funding, much more naturally with these sort of smaller funding. If you need to know any more, that is the website where the man who wrote this presentation was, minus the references to John McCarthy and Jack Ripper. Um, but if that's all, thank you very much. Thank you. Time management.
I was writing it to 10 to 12 and you were saying, you've clearly got no time management skills. Oh, it'll be fine. <laughs> and what he was doing was he was trying to drum up interest. So you were actually, you were finding how many people asked you about your um, talk this morning. <laughs> actually, <laughs> I was doing a brown bag session. Yeah, <laughs>